And uh, first of all, uh, what are data streams and what are we really talking about here? Let's first give a small uh, definition, what is that? So in computer science, a data stream, a stream is a sequence of data elements made available over time. So the important thing here is really time. So not always you get all the data in advance and you have to compute it step by step. So this was Wise Wikipedia who told us that and that uh, is very like kind of a defined knowledge, it's very common. So here let's take a look at this simplified view of a system. I draw terribly, please forgive me, but uh, bear with me, uh, it will be better later. And uh, so what happens as soon as we put some load on this, on the system like that, that has two taps like that go each one to uh, I think I can point that. Okay, cool. So uh, that has two taps and these go always to the same sync, to the to the same like destination. Uh, what happens is like if you put on one side load, depending on the speed of that load that's coming, uh, it can equilibrate on one side of the system. Ideally, your system which is processing on this side shouldn't influence on the other, so this is kind of an ideal case. Uh, and that's what we want to achieve. What we want to achieve is that things don't influence in each other if they don't have, but not always that's the case, and depending on the load that you put, things can be equilibrated, things can be stable, or they can uh, evolve in a different way. So if you put a bit more load, like maybe from a different side of your application, you get like an increased overload in the system that goes to the same sink in the end. But like uh, things tend to accumulate if you don't handle them carefully. And like accumulating like in terms of Erlang and Elixir process is something more like having a mailbox getting full and full and nobody collecting events or messages there. And until you reach a moment that if this load is sustained and this mailbox keeps growing and you don't have anyone collecting them, the thing just disasters. And that was a great story. I spent two hours doing that. And, uh, so what I want to point out here is that the size of the pipes also don't really matter if the size of the sink, the final sink, is the same. So even if our vats were bigger or our pipes were bigger, it wouldn't it matter in the end because we will reach the same uh, the same uh, destination. So how to solve this? So let's go back a bit and uh, see what was in the beginning. Just this simplified view. Like how can we avoid this load to be sustained and to overload our system? So let's let's install some IoT devices that we will call re demand regulators. They will be there and they will be in the points that the system kind of makes some action, makes some work. So, and in the point that pipes join or interesting things happen. So what this thing will have, this well, small device will have, is one sensor and one transmitter. The sensor will say, like, if it can handle more data, if it can handle more load, or and like it will transmit to its helpers if it can take more load from them. So uh, the, the rule is the following. If the following pipe, if the pipe that is after that small device is free, you see that you can take more load, then you say to your pre predecessor that, hey, send me more work. And that's what will happen. And as soon as we, as you, the first in the bottom realizes that it can handle more load, it will let the previous know. This is just a message. I'm symbolizing with a color just to say, hey, this guy sent this message. So this will propagate up, like in the system, will propagate to the boundary of the system. And hopefully, in the end, like your vets turn on. Oh, sorry. So your vets on. So also that was a couple of hours there, uh, um, but that's that's the important thing. Uh, that after you get some load in the initial uh, boundary of the system, it, the important thing is to shut it, to shut it up. 
So the producers of that load will not keep putting load in the system, so you can actually work without being overloaded. And we kind of push the, the problem elsewhere. Someone else has to handle this load which is accumulated. But the important thing is that it's not in this system. Uh, so we get to this idea of demand-driven communication, which what we are using here. So the consumers demand work. Instead of receiving work, they just demand work. They ask for events. They ask for data. And this demand is pushed like uh, to the boundary of the system as it's propagating up, it's bubbling up, and in the end you achieve back pressure with that. So you are not uh, your your previous producers have an idea of what they are putting in the system. So this pressure is on them. So let's talk about how Elixir is bringing this uh, to the language, uh, which is with GenStage, as mentioned before. So uh, in, in GenStage, you have producers and consumers and other types of, uh, another type of uh, stage that I will not talk now, but you have the producer and the consumer, and the consumer asks for load, asks for work. And then the producer realizes, hey, my consumer is ready to get more, more work, and sends at most the thing that the, the consumer asks for. This is the important thing, because even if the consumer is very fast, and the producer cannot catch up with that, we are fine. But if the consumer is very slow and the producer respects the contract, respects that it will send at most this amount of work, it will be fine in the end. We will not be in that clogged situation as we saw in the beginning. So that was the, the main, uh, that's the main revolution of uh, GenStage to bring this in uh, the, the uh, normal behavior, which is like, this behavior is an abstraction over data streams. It is demand driven, so you don't have just this idea of receiving load and receiving work without knowing where it comes from. You actually know and you you acknowledge that you can um, that you can accept that, and you become to be concurrent in the end. This we will, we will see in more details later. And another important point here is that GenStage being a uh, a behavior in the OTP behavior, it fits very nicely in a supervision tree. So you can have these very nice pro processes, handling work, supervised in an easy way. So let's talk about flow now, which is an abstraction which is made on top of GenStage, which will provide a familiar API for people who are used to work with enum or with string. They will kind of see the same code and they will can, they can even think it works the same way, but the important is get things done. And uh, it provides this clean API while still being lazy and while still being very concurrent. Um, so flow, it's, it's something like that. It, seems, it looks like that. So you get a, a file stream, for example, you open the file stream just reminding that this stream is just a representation, just an abstraction from this file and you turn that in from an enumerable, this will be a flow now, I knew it was an enumerable because it was just a stream, and like you can flat map, split things by words, partition them, and then reduce them. Here we are computing a word count, which is a very similar way of computing a word count, and the important thing is we are still being concurrent, and no matter the size of the file, we will still be uh, efficient. And in the end, another important thing is that in the end, just when you say, give me a list, a non to list, is that the work will start to, to, to follow. I mean, it will start at that moment. So uh, let's see how this kind of is mapped into process behind the scenes. Like all these bubbles that you're seeing there will be stages. So that's something that uh, Flow could generate. Uh, and here is what I mentioned in the beginning, that there's a producer and the, the consumer, and this intermediate step, which is the producer-consumer. At the same time, as like B and C, it will receive work, receive data, and will produce to further, uh, further transformations. So the important step here, the nice step here, for example, is from B to C, that you have this partition step of the flow. So you are still being while reading from the file in name, 
while you are reading from the file, you are also computing and also reducing in the end. So it's a small MapReduce in your machine, very, uh, very behaved, uh, very behaved, sorry. Uh, so let's show a more real life example uh, with like processing uh, Twitter handles, just a very simple stuff. It's building up on what we did before. So given a list of Twitter handles, get the most used hashtags and we will solve the same problem with three module, um, modules um, Enum, Stream and Flow Enum, the traditional eager way of doing uh, processing lists Stream being a bit more lazy and Flow being lazy and concurrent at the same time So first we will define some small functions which will be like the handles Elixir Lang, Erlang Factory, Prisma Chord uh, uh, and last tweet we'll just use an, a library to go to Twitter's API, search for, from that handle and return the recent ones. It's kind of, it will return what these people are talking about. That's, that's the, the point. So let's see, first within now, we are being eager here. So remember that we will take the Twitter handle, <coughs> no matter, here is just like five. Uh, no matter if these are millions or thousands, we will take all of them, we will flat map over all of them, taking the last tweets, then we will split, take the hashtags, and then we will split and do the same as we did before. We count them, so we, we, we group them. Uh, and uh, in, the, in the stream, essentially the same code, it's almost the same code, just changing two models, modules, and, uh, but we are being lazy here. So instead of going for all the last tweets in advance, we will go step by step, element by element. However, we are still bound to one process working. We are still in the same process and this guy is the only one working. With flow, it's a bit different, but not so much. We will show just some special things here, just to make it more spicy. And we will first build a flow from an innumerable, the same as you saw before, flat, flat map over them, the same as you saw before with the num and, and stream, sorry. And, um, okay. uh, and then take the hashtags, partition them, because we want multiple uh, gen stages working. Here we are giving this uh, option, which is saying the amount of stages. So we have many options that we can pass in. So this will distribute work to five stages. And here we have to say how the hashtags, which are like objects, let's say, which are structs in this, can, in this case, how they are going to be identified. They need to be identified by their text. So what it has inside, because it's a bit uh, more complex data structure. So then we need to reduce them the same way as we did before, the function is almost the same, and turn it into an enum. Remember, like, the work only begins, begins when we turn this into an enum, when we need the value, when we need the result. Uh, so, yeah, cool. So let's see what this generates if I don't ask for the enum, if I don't ask for the result, what will be the, the what, what do we get? Like we get this representation of the data structure of the flow. So here you can see the stages that I passed in. Here's the operation it's going to do, the redo, reduce. Uh, here are the flows, the producers. And here, for example, you can see our, our input. And here are some interesting uh, options that we, I will say a bit more with details before, which is the windowing. Here we are not using any windowing, but you can also say like every 100, every 1000, give me some result. But here is the global window. So for every element, give me the result of counting, uh, counting up, like grouping them up uh, together. So uh, everything fine so far? Any questions? Okay, so let's talk about dispatching events. Uh, so one important concept of gen stage and flow is how do we actually send uh, work, how do we actually send events, data to our consumers. So there are some um, implemented dispatchers, which are the demand dispatcher, broadcast dispatcher, and partition dispatcher. And you can also 
customizer. So if you have a custom use case that your consumers are somehow special and you have to send uh, information to them as uh, for, for some uh, special business groups or something like that, you can always customize. You can define some uh, callbacks and uh, everything works. Mm -hmm. So what you will need to do is like how to do subscribe, how to cancel and ask for events and some others. So how does that uh, reflect in real life, let's say? So you have one producer, and let's say you are using first the partition dispatcher. So you have to have a partition key, and based on that key, you will route this to B, C, or D. Broadcast dispatcher, it's like instead of choosing which one you will send to, you will send to all of them, and you will, that's an important thing of the broadcast dispatcher, it will regulate if the consumers have different speeds. So if you, for example, B is super fast and it finishes its work very fast compared to C, it will work until C finishes its batch to get together the new batch. So you kind of keep this notion of speed between all your consumers, which can be very useful for some use cases. And the demand dispatcher is like kind of the first one who demands more, gets more. Uh, so let's see first like how this uh, we, were, we are talking about events and how nowadays we do event processing with gen event that comes from airline for example you have some process and this process sends some event to an event manager this event manager has several handlers potentially and they have to process this event according to to some rules but it will do that to all the functions that, it, uh, that are defined in the handler, so to F, G, and H. So this is a default OTP behavior, there's no change here, it's more like a comparison. And there are some drawbacks from Gen Event that Gen Stage tries to, to, to uh, improve. Which first is, like the manager runs handling everything in one process, so every code that runs against the event uh, data it's run, in, it's run in process and this way we don't really leverage the components that the Beam can provide. And it has some strange error semantics. If you ever use Gen Stage, or Gen Event, sorry, if you ever use Gen Event, you will notice that when you have an error in the handler, somehow all the handlers are out, out of the manager. This kind of the manager says, uh, uh, says well, I don't really uh, accept that the handlers are erring out and I just push them on, which is a bit strange for, for, uh, for a crash, which uh, shouldn't be so impact so widely the system. Uh, so how does Gen Event try to solve that? So you will have the same idea of producers and consumers, but now the load, the work will be events that will be sent like in the list here, I'm sure it's just one, but with a broadcast, broadcast dispatcher, you could have the handlers, the, the code of the handlers in each consumer. So these consumers would, would work differently according to their needs. And still, like if they are, have uh, problems like with errors, if they crash, a supervisor can uh, restart them individually without affecting the others. And as well, we leverage the concurrency of the meeting. So that's very cool, that's very uh, nice, but how do we use that in real life? In real life, you could take like these dispatchers, uh, these uh, consumers, and make them do different stuff. For example, if you create, let's say, a product or a user in a database, and you have to send notifications, and you have some, to, to do some kind of data analysis, you can separate this into different modules that will work independently of each other and uh, can achieve their purpose. And the idea is that in the future, when uh, GenStage is more mature, this will also be uh, possible to do, like, uh, to, possible to be done distributed. Uh, so, so let's see another uh, thing that is coming with the same batch of improvements to a mixer, which is when you have, for example, you have a producer and a consumer, and the consumer is somehow very slow. Yeah, it's nice that we don't overload our system, so we don't put more load on it, but it's also nice if we can be faster. 
And if we know that this consumer is kind of CPU bound, we could actually run this parallel in parallel, whatever runs in B in, in this consumer. So for that, you have a dynamic supervisor. The dynamic supervisor is not only for that, so it's, uh, the idea is that it can be used to many other things, but it also complies to, to the same contract of gen stage. So the idea is that when you get some event, you fire off one child that will uh, process only that event, and as long as events come, you will, you will work this according to, to these children. So these children will be just spun off doing its work and dying. And uh, here, I could be in, as in the same letter as before, but it's important that these things don't need to be gen stages. They, are, they just have to be in the, have the same logic. And the dynamic supervisor will know all about asking more uh, data, uh, providing more, um, sorry, it will ask more uh, work and also like knowing how to dispatch it. So the dynamic supervisor is, can be, as I said, a consumer on the gen stage pipeline and it has like one condition which is like it only has one child specification so in advance you provide this child specification and it will, of every child that it has, it will use that same specification however it only supports the one for one strategy so if your child dies, only this child will be uh, restarted okay so far, any questions? okay so let's Give some more uh, real examples, uh, not only like give a <coughs> say about the structure of the code, but let's process like a tweet stream, the same as before, building up in the same uh, example as before, but with some more um, work going on, which will be getting tweets from a specific term and compute the most used hashtags of the moment. So for that, you have to have an idea of streaming of the moment. The moment is what's coming from Twitter every time. We will use some tools for that. We will use X Twitter, as I mentioned before, GenStage and Flow. So you don't need to use GenStage and Flow together, but here is kind of a showcase of how they can uh, work together. And since some things are already very easily implemented in Flow, why don't we just use it? Uh, for that, uh, we will implement three modules. One producer, which will talk to kind of receive the tweets from Twitter. One analyzer, which will do all the data processing, gathering the information. And one consumer, which will just log. Just say, hey, those are the things that people are talking about. So, uh, let's see a bit of this code. Uh, so, the producer is the first one, it's the gen stage. It will just fire off one process and that will be hearing the stream and sending to itself the stream. It's important here that this, just for the sake of simplicity, I did it this way, but the, important, uh, the ideal way is that your producer reads from a persistent data store, from a message queue, from a, a database, a file, whatever. So even if it is, it, uh, this way it will be not overloaded with data. But in this example, Twitter APIs quite slow to, to, to the speed of the, of the processing, so it's fine. But the principles are the same. So we will handle demand that comes, uh, that comes from our consumers, and this demand will be a number here, and uh, some tweets which are like our, uh, our state, we are storing the <coughs> tweets in our state, so this is what I mentioned with the message queue that can go very very long if the consumers are not fast enough and here what we are doing we are trying to push just what the just what the consumers are demanding so we split this uh, this list of tweets that we have in our state by the demand so we keep the demand uh, we keep the remaining ones and we send the demand and we, when we have kind of a long queue waiting when, when it's more than 500 tweets, we just flush them. And what's important is that we can still keep the idea of flushing and sending uh, events to our consumers and they will still pick up. It's not that they will work only when they ask. If the producer is sending more, it will also pick it up. 
So, ah, uh, oh, sorry. Uh, here is the flushing, and here is like when you receive a tweet, and that's fine. You can gather it in this in this uh, in this uh, state, and um, we'll uh, we'll keep it in the state and not send anything to the consumers. That's important. Here is what will be dispatched to the consumers. The same way as we sent the, the tweets here, here we are just keeping everything. So the analyzer, the analyzer is what the analyzer is where we are going to process, do the important work. Which in this point we will start, this is just a helper function just to start this off. And the, it will receive its producer and its consumers. It will take that producer, make a flow out of it, and then turn it in, into stages. So in the end, we are just working with stages. So take that uh, in the main flow, what we are going to do? Take the producer, say it's from a stage because our previous uh, previous module was a gen stage. Make a flat map the same way as we saw before. Partition it, and here I wanted to show off this uh, this nice nice uh, thing from. <coughs> from flow, which is having windows. So you can say, as I mentioned before, take that window, that global window, and instead of waiting for the whole window to finish, just dispatch every 100 uh, elements. And the same, the key, the hashtag has to be identified by its text. So let's reduce it. It will do the same way as before, take these uh, tweets and put them together, and then emit its state. That's important because we will have a consumer later, and this uh, consumer will take whatever we consume, we process so far here, and uh, on this emit action. Cool, fine. Uh, so the final one, which is very simple, is more like outputting. Uh, it's a gen state as well. It's a consumer, and what's important is that it doesn't need to have any state, so we can put whatever there and. And uh, what we are going to do is, like for the aggregates that come uh, upstream, we are going to sort them, take the top 10, and then display. Hey, here are the final aggregates uh, for the bug, and uh, here are the top hashtags that we could find. And I decided to do here just everything in one function, just like for the sake of simplicity, but you can also put this in the supervision tree and having it working while you consume things along the way. So, start all of them, say which one is, uh, is the producer, the consumer, and then start the analyzer. And remember, remember that the, the analyzer needs both access to its producer and its consumers, that here are just a list. And just sleep forever and let's see what happens. So let's try this out. Uh, so first thing that I wanted to show, like, ah, people who talk about Elixir maybe are talking about Elm. Very nice, let's do that. My Elixir status. I got silence, absolutely nothing. Because essentially you get one tweet every, I don't know, half an hour. And to test it was not really great. The same with the Elixir line, kind of a bit more, a bit less, depending on the time. But then I decided, what are people talking about in this moment? What is like something that we will get a lot of things. Trump, man, everybody's talking about Trump, and that's what I got when I when I triggered this. And like I received a ton of tweets, and okay, let's process them. Uh, it was working fine in the end. Uh, I suffered a bit through some caveats, and that's what I got. Like a bunch of hashtags that are some somehow funny. Uh, in, like I was at some moments just watching what people were talking in this moment. That's pretty funny. And like this, in the end, this is a very simple code. There is no black magic involved here, but it provides a powerful solution with, with, which shows how flexible is all these modules. And uh, here I didn't show some other options that you can configure, like what is the max demand that you accept, what is the mean demand. But this thing is like, depending on the use case, <coughs> you will find this in the, the documentation. So as a conclusion, it's a powerful abstraction, it's full of potential, it's experimental, just remember I omitted the alias experimental stuff here because yeah, it was some, in some part of the code. 
and it's coming the future releases of Elixir. The idea is quite stable. I have been playing with this for some time now, and like when I was finishing preparing for the talk, it almost nothing changed. And if you want to learn more, <coughs> just go there, read the docs. They are pretty, pretty uh, accessible. They are super showing with many details, with many examples, with drawings, with pictures. And the code is also very, very nice to read, not difficult. And learn you, learn, learn you some more language. It's like the book, but it's also learn with it. Uh, it's a very important thing uh, that we have to keep in mind, that we can only achieve this because of the book. So thank you. If you have any questions, I'm here. This is my Twitter handle, as you saw before. Distribution was yet to come. Yeah. Uh, do you have any information on the plan? And by distribution, you mean connecting different nodes to one another? Yeah, that meaning that you, let's assume that you already have that, meaning that you can have stages in different nodes. So you say that now my consumer is not here, but it's in another node, and like maybe we still use the, the Erlang and distribution for that. So there's no change on the underlying uh, concepts. Any other questions? Um, is it usable from Vesit Ala, so without Elixir or? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, like in the end, uh, Elixir and Erlang code are like interchangeably. You can use one inside of the other with some caveats, but you could use this theoretically. Yes. I don't know how far someone tried to do it, especially with Gen Stage, which is very experimental. But like with other libraries, like in Elixir, you can use Erlang libraries and the other thing. Any other question? Okay, cool. Thank you very much.